ways to tell if an argument is valid or invalid. The first one is the counterexample method. Um, the counterexample method is that if the argument is invalid, um, you can come up with a, a counterexample. So you can think of a way in the uh, premises could be true and the conclusion is false. And that would show the argument's invalid. But this is why this is the con. So it works with everything, um, but the problem is sometimes it's hard to think up counterexamples because the argument may be about some topic you're unfamiliar with. Um, and second, if the argument is valid, you're not going to find a counterexample. So you only can come up with counterexamples for uh, for invalid arguments. And um, if the argument's valid, you could be trying all day to find an argument. Okay, uh, then there's the Venn diagram method. I really like this method. I find it intuitive and some students really like it. But other students, it seems like no matter how hard they try, they just can't get it. The famous form method is really easy. Um, you memorize the famous forms of argument. In a more advanced logic class, and actually the other good thing about this is you memorize these famous forms, you can go take Introduction to Logic, and um, the Introduction to Logic would build on the famous form method, and you'd be able to, to use that going forward. Drawback of the famous form method is that uh, I'm only going to teach you four famous forms, and they're way um, more valid argument forms than four. So you're only going to learn four um, in this class, but um, it'll also give you a feel of what a valid argument. And then there's finally there's the rule method, and students really like this. Uh, you memorize a list of ten rules, but the big drawback is that you're not going to remember <laughs> those ten rules after the class ends, and I want you to um, uh, to be able to take uh, what you learn in this class and apply it to your life to become a better critical thinker. So the famous four method will um, most likely do that. Okay, so um, before we go on to talk about the famous forms, let's talk about why it matters um, whether we know if an argument is uh, valid or invalid. So Daniel Kahneman addresses this um, and he lays out this syllogism. It says, um, all roses are flowers, some flowers fade quickly, Therefore, some roses fade quickly. And he gave this question to uh, university students all over. And this is what he has to say about it. Um, Kahneman says that the vast majority of college students endorse the syllogism is valid because they endorse the conclusion. So uh, students read this and they say all roses are flowers, some flowers fade quickly, therefore some roses fade quickly. Um, they see the conclusion, they say, oh yeah, well yeah, some roses do fade quickly. They like the conclusion and they say, yeah, that must be valid. Turns out this is not a valid argument because it could be all roses are flowers, some flowers fade quickly. It could be that um, the roses are not in the group of flowers that fade quickly. Um, the roses are not part of that sum. So this is not a valid argument. Uh, but students endorse it as valid because they like the conclusion. And this is a dangerous sort of way, it's a dangerous way to, th uh, to reason, it's not a critical way to reason, to endorse an argument just because you like the conclusion. And you can think about this in political context. Um, uh, someone gives a conclusion you like, and you will endorse any way. Um, so this is how our minds work, our biased minds. We like the conclusion, and we will um, check off on any method of getting to the to that conclusion. So um, we don't want people believing arguments just because they like the conclusion. You want to be able to dissect the argument and say, "Hey, look, that doesn't follow. Um, all roses are flowers. Yes, some flowers fade quickly. Yes, but how do we know that roses are part of the group of flowers that fade quickly?" Um, Roses could be outside the circle of the flowers that they quickly. So um, that's what a critical thinker would do, would um, dissect the argument and say, hey, look, that conclusion doesn't follow. All right. So that's why knowing if arguments are valid and invalid are important um, in critical thinking. So let's talk about the famous forms. Um, here they are. Here are the four famous forms we're going to learn. Uh, modus ponens, modus tollens, disjunctive syllogism, and hypothetical syllogism. So here's modus ponens. 
um, modus ponens is if P then Q, P then Q. It's really simple, it's really straightforward, it's one of those things that is so easy, um, it's hard. Although I think it's so easy, it's easy. You're just saying the same thing twice in a row. If P then Q, if P then Q. If P then Q, P, therefore Q. Okay, so let me give you an example. If P, it's in the red, if you complete all the degree requirements by May 15th, then Q, then you can graduate. And now I'm going to say, so this is something that might be written in the um, college catalog handbook. And then I'm going to affirm P, Damien completed the degree requirements by May 15th. P obtains, therefore, what can you infer from this? Then Damien is going to graduate. Okay, so um, this first part, the P part is called the um, antecedent. The Q part is called the consequent. So the antecedent comes first. If you complete all the degree requirements by May 15th, antecedent, then consequent. Let me just address soundness really fast. So we, I, we said that if there's this validated form and each of the premises are true, then the argument is, is, uh, is sound if the form is valid and each of the statements is true. So um, suppose it turns out that I'm, I'm saying, yeah, Damien completed the degree requirements by May 15th, but suppose I'm lying. Um, that would make the argument, the argument would still be valid, but it would be unsound. So the form is a good one, but it would be unsound if it turns out that Damien did not complete the degree requirements by May. Okay. So conditional reasoning, here we go. So conditional reasoning is used by modus ponens, modus tollens, and hypothetical syllogism. Conditional is, an, any conditional is an if-then statement. So here we, go, here we go. If the bank is open, then I can deposit my check. So this is conditional reasoning. If this, so here's an example. Um, so we're just gonna plug in any old thing. We're gonna plug in um, Greebach for A and Scroon for B. If it's a Greebach, then it's Scroon. Gronk is a Greebach, therefore Gronk is Scroon. So if it's a P, then it's a Q. P, therefore Q. Uh, we just made up nonsense words, um, plugged them in, and it's still valid. If it's a Greebach, then it's Scroon. It's a Greebach, therefore it's Scroon. So again, that is valid, uh, but it is not sound because there's no such things as Gronks and Greek Reeboks. Oh, there's Gronk. He says he's screwed. Okay, valid or invalid. Okay, what about this one? If Steve, if Steve is a thief, then he's a murderer. Steve is a murderer, therefore Steve is a thief. Is this valid or invalid? Is this does this demonstrate the good form of modus ponens or is something uh, gone astray? There's the thief slash murderer, Steve. It's actually invalid. Why is it invalid? Well, it's using this um, modus ponens lookalike that is called affirming the consequent. If Steve is a thief, if P, then Q, modus ponens would uh, say, P, it's affirming the antecedent. P, then Q, right? But this one says if P, then Q, Q, then P. And that is actually invalid. If Steve is a thief, then he's a murderer. Steve is a murderer, therefore he's a, he's a thief. So this doesn't follow because this says that um, all thieves are murderers. It does not say that all murderers are thieves. So um, this is actually an invalid argument. And um, again, if the argument's invalid, then it's automatically unsound. This is the example of affirming the consequent. Um, and for those of you who are taking the LSAT or have taken the LSAT, uh, the LSAT is the um, exam to get into law school. There's a section on the test that tests your ability to tell the difference between modus ponens and the modus ponens lookalike. Here's another one. This one actually, so here's how logic can be helpful in real life. And I taught this in this uh, lecture last fall and I had a student come up to me and said this exact thing had happened to her. So here's a dishonest mechanic. 
um, if the battery is dead, then the car won't start. The car won't start, so let's replace the battery. Okay, is his reasoning um, sound? Is, his reason, is this a valid argument or an invalid argument? Let's break down his, his argument. If the battery is dead, then the car won't start. And you go, okay, well that's true. And you know the car won't start, therefore the battery's dead. Hey, sounds good, right? Um, no, um, you might be selling out, oh, how much the batteries cost? Between 80 and $120? You, you'll be wasting that money um, because it's not necessarily the battery. It's invalid. Uh, deceptive reasoning, let's go back. So this is using, again, um, the affirming the consequent pattern. So, um, if the battery is dead, if A, then B, it's affirming the consequent. If B, therefore A. And that is not um, the valid pattern. It's a bad pattern of reasoning. Um, it's true that if the battery is dead, then the car won't start. But there are other reasons the car won't start other than the battery being dead. So you can't infer that the battery is dead just from the fact that the car won't start. So, um, and this person um, had this happen, and it turned out it wasn't the battery. And she bought a new battery for nothing. Um, okay, here's another example. Okay, so um, in an invalid argument, there could be circumstances where the premises are true, but the conclusion is false. So that's another way to think about it. So let's look at this argument. If lemons are red, then lemons have a color. Lemons have a color, so lemons are red. Okay, so let's think about this. Um, so in a, um, a valid argument, if the premises are true, then the conclusion has to be true. You're locked in there. So is there a way for this to be true? If lemons are red, then lemons have a color. Okay, well that's true. Um, that's tautologous, of course. Lemons have a color, so lemons are red. So can you make one true and two true, but three false? Um, so this is uh, the counterexample method. Um, and it's really easy with things like lemons and colors because you're familiar with that. But this will help you kind of grasp what's going on here. If lemons are red, then lemons have a color. Lemons have a color, so lemons are red. How can you make one true and true true, but three false? Well, um, it's true that if lemons are red, then lemons have a color. Lemons have a color. Let's say lemons are purple. Lemons are yellow. Lemons are blue. Lemons are any other color than red. It would make one, two, and true, two, but three false. So this is invalid. Here are some purple lemons. Those, I think, are either dyed or that's photoshopped. Uh, let's see. I have a pink lemonade tree. Um, the lemons are supposed to be pink if I ever get lemons off the tree. Um, let's see. Okay, so this is, again, this is the fallacy of affirming um, the consequent. If A, then B, B, then A. Modus ponens should be, if A, then B, A, then B. Lemons are red, therefore lemons have a color. So these two are switched here, and this is invalid. Okay, next one. Okay, so that concludes our talk about um, modus ponens and its pretender affirming the consequent. So now let's talk about modus tollens and its